action. We're all very excited to have these new characters come in. Must I drop my robe and show you what naked means? Ah! They brought a real life to Outland that we haven't seen before. Of course, the world is not always a happy place. And it's this other world, this, this Parisian world, and the characters are quite big. This woman is a liar and a witch. Each character has its own action, has a ripple down the line in the past or the future. I'm fascinated by things, not of this time. Le Comte et la Comtesse Saint-Germain. Comte de Saint-Germain is based on a real historical figure. He is the first villain that they encounter in the first episode. Claire and Jamie enter a new world, but suddenly have a new enemy. Je serai bien sûr du voyage. Yeah, I don't think the Comte Saint-Germain have any limits whatsoever. <laughs> Saint-Germain is definitely, definitely ready to kill to make his way up to the top. He is somebody who I happen to find socializing in Paris, and it's all about the money. Je vous avais bien dit qu'il t'entraîne nous extorquer quelques fortunes! James knows this is no time for negotiation. He becomes quite a, a powerful figure and is never far away from, from any trouble that happens in Paris. Claire said it perfectly. There is darkness in every one. It's a fact. So obviously this guy maybe have a little bit more of evil. I see a shadow behind your eyes. But I mean, evil people don't think they're evil. They think they're doing the right thing. And that's what I think is working his way up to the top. Don St. Germain is a dangerous character, dark, mysterious. We didn't actually look at Stanley Weber originally. Stanley auditioned for the King role. But when we saw him audition for King Louis, we thought, oh my God, what an amazing Saint Germain. Stanley as uh, Saint Germain was a lot of fun. He was a, a, a big man, big character. He was just fun to work with. He really enjoyed playing Saint Germain. He really threw himself into it and just, you know, milked it for all it was worth. His Royal Highness, Prince Charles Edward Stuart. He is the young pretender to the British throne, the eldest son of James III, who is trying to drum together the Jacobite cause in Paris. It's a character that everyone in Scotland knows, and I think we all know from history that, you know, he was a pretty dangerous man. And uh, Andrew is doing a, just a terrific job. He's, he's, a, he's got a great humour. And now I am in need of a woman. Or maybe two. He's like an animal that's sort of been kept in a cage. He's followed his father around for the whole of his life. And I am on a gap year in Paris. And I am out on my own. And I'm, I mean business. It is God's will that I be the beacon of light. For I am, by divine right, the outstretched hand of God. What we needed to see from Prince Charlie was a character that you understood why men would follow him ultimately to their doom and also see why it all was doomed at the same time. And you could kind of see that almost sometimes in the same sentence with Andrew's performance. It is intolerable! I'd rather be run through by a British bayonet and have my body buried in an unmarked grave than turn back after we have come this far. Because you saw the sort of the fervent patriot, you know, who would who would talk in very profound terms. And you can kind of see he was also kind of a crazy, and he wasn't really a, a great soldier, but he wanted to be a great soldier. And it was just a fascinating performance. You sort of admired him and pitied him all at the same time. He's more of a dreamer. He thinks that God has put him on a mission. And he's a prince, and a prince in, the, in this time doesn't need a lot of justification for what he does. And Jamie sees through all that, and I think it's easy for Jamie to see how this is all going to come apart if this man is the one who, who actually tries to lead the Jacobites in a rebellion against, against the British Empire. Prince Charlie is not ready to rule. He thinks he is, which is what makes him so dangerous. A leader must be decisive. Andrew came in and blew us all away. He had a different take than we anticipated originally, but we just loved him and he's mesmerizing. I think you can't take your eyes away from Andrew when he's on screen. Bravo! I wish you and the Marquis all the happiness in the world. Thank you, your royal highness. Louise is Claire's best friend in Paris. She's rather flighty and frivolous, but has a very good heart. Do you want the baby? Of course I want it. It's 
My lovers, it's his, it's mine. She also is the secret mistress of Charles Stewart. <laughs> Louise Duran is married to the family Duran, who has an important part in the high society. She's a little bit like her little monkey, but the monkey's in the gold cage. She thinks she's free in a way. She's an aristocrat, she knows everybody. She's the one that gets Claire into the court of Versailles for the first time and to meet the king. I'm intimate with all the noble families. Their genealogy, and their allegiances. She's someone that's quite unlikely in terms of who Claire probably would have chosen as a friend. It's so good to see you. She becomes very important in Claire's life. She is the example of the Parisian woman who is married to another man and is creating her own fun behind the scenes. A rare jewel you've brought. Louise is truly in love with Prince Charles. Maybe because he wants the power, but he doesn't have the power yet. He will be the king, but he's not at this moment. She will have to make some very hard decision. You mean sleep with my husband? But my lover would be furious. Louise was charming and funny. Claire brought this humanity to the role. You could see that she cared about someone, but that she was really above all these things at the same time. She was the personification of a lady of the era. How long has it been? Since this morning. Mother Hildegard is the superior of the religious order that runs the charity hospital. And she is quite a formidable character in the beginning. And how can we help you, madame? Is one of your servants here today? She can see that Claire has something to offer the hospital uh, rather quickly. And she realizes that Claire's dedicated. And then she sort of embraces her as, as someone who can really help out. Perhaps you could help Sister Angelique? Dress the wounds of a young boy with scrofula. And this is where Claire is brought when, when she also loses her baby and Mother Hildegard's there to sort of help her heal and help her go through that. So she's a very important character. She has such a gravitas to her as a character and no one messes with Mother Hildegard. She played fantastically by Frances de la Tour. She really adapted that role and, and just played it much better than we ever imagined. Mary, stop hiding and come meet a new friend. Mary Hawkins is introduced in the story as a friend of Louise de Rohan. She's a very young English girl. She doesn't realize immediately that the reason Mary's name sounds familiar to her is because she's seen it before on uh, the genealogy of her first husband, Frank Randall. Mary is a young girl who is in Paris because her uncle has taken her to meet a man who will be her fiance, it's an arranged marriage, so she's kind of thrown into it, um, and she's very naive. My maid said that a, a Frenchman's thing, you know, he put it right between a lady's legs, I mean, right up inside her. No! Yes! They form kind of a sisterly bond, and she becomes very important in Claire's life, and a very important factor in the story many times over. We were attacked on the street. Four brigands. It's like the BM, is it? No, we're okay, but Mary... She was assaulted and raped. Rosie as Mary had a tricky role because she had to be the one English rose that was out of sync with everyone else and always a little bit behind all that. And it could have easily been a caricature, but she made it kind of a very human role and she sort of made it a girl that you cared about that was in over her head. Mary Hawkins is sweet, innocent, but there's a real steeliness to Mary that uh, Rosie brings out and it takes a really amazing acting ability that Rosie has. When she kills her attacker, I believed it. You know, there was something in her eyes that grew kind of cold and hard at the moment she realized that that was the man, and when she picked up the knife, it, it, it felt real and scary, and I really liked that about her performance. That wicked little minx. She's found herself a lover even before the exchange of wedding vows. Now, Alex Randall is quite different from his brother. He's a clergyman and a very kind uh, young man. In that moment when Jamie sees him, he's quite taken aback, and so the, the likeness to him. Yeah, we're acquainted. But very quickly realizes he's nothing like his evil brother. It's the one person in the world that Jack really uh, loves and cares for. That relationship seems to be the exception to the rule in, in, in Jack's life. I must ask you to do something for me. <laughs> for us. Anything. Alex was great. You know, it was a difficult role to, to cast because he had to sort of evoke Jack and not be the spitting image of Jack. He also had to be frail. He had to realize that he was dying for slowly from within. His condition actually becomes quite pivotal in, in the plot points. The king gives you leave to rise. 
Louis the Fifteen, yeah, he's uh, the king of France. He got the power, and it's very, it was very interesting to to feel that emotion. The king's mercurial and you know completely autocratic power is a big part of the story because the king can do anything he wants. He can order any of them to death. He can save any of them. Claire ends up needing to ask his pardon for Jamie once Jamie's put in prison for dueling, and that comes at the price. I am at your majesty's complete disposal. It is probably one of one of the shocking things of the season. She will do anything to save Jamie, so that's what she does. It's interesting to feel that when you have the power of everything. It's a power to be reckoned with, and he wears it really easily, and he's, he's very cognizant of his power whenever he goes. He's one of the last absolute monarchs. Who the hell are you? Fergus is scrappy, he's intelligent, he's a wannabe Jamie. As soon as we saw Roman audition, we kind of instantly knew he'd be a great Fergus. There was such a twinkle in his eyes and he just kind of knocked our socks off. English was a second language to him, but he had a, a certain ease with it and uh, the actors all enjoyed working with him a lot. And it was always just fun whenever Roman was on the set, he just kind of brightened the day. The funniest sight I think I've ever seen was him on a donkey one day. He, his legs were as long as the donkeys and the donkey refused to move and so there's like handlers everywhere trying to get this donkey to move and Roman's practically just walking on the ground. It's lovely how that dynamic changes um, a scene. You know, things can be quite intense and heavy. When he comes into the room, you just get this feeling there's, there's more mischievous and, and lightness involved. It's quite funny, Claire and Fergus's relationship, because in the beginning, she's not quite sure of him, and, and there's a little bit of animosity, but over time, you know, they really form a strong bond, and, and he does become like her adopted son. Jack's connection with him is accidental. I mean, he doesn't know who the boy is when he encounters him in the brothel. But it does, a sort of, in a, a, those strange turns of fate, become quite a pivotal meeting in Jack's life because it obviously then results in the duel and everything that that entails. Mustard. Thyme in walnut oil, I believe. I see your nose is not purely decorative, my donor. Mr. Raymond is a local apothecary whom Claire consults professionally, but who has an immediate rapport with her. You must, in point of fact, be my friend. Thank you. I could use a friend. And the two of them sort of share secrets and sort of share sort of knowledge with each other. For you, Madonna, for our protection, it will change color in the presence of poison. He feels very much like Claire's counterpart. They have a lot in common in, with their interests. There's something about him that she's just enamored by in a way. He becomes very important in her life and it's sort of a refuge for Claire to go to him and he's absolutely wonderfully played by Dominique Pinon. He's a total pro. I mean, I think he and Claire just really uh, bounced off each other really well. For you, Madonna, today, there's no charge. Jamie and Claire are very adept at maneuvering in Parisian society. I do miss the smell of the stebo. I think they do a great job diving in and figuring out the people they need to know and what they need to do to survive and get what they want. We figured it out. Oh, this calls for a celebration. 